Good evening and welcome. Yes. The wonderful, the wonderful mu musicians of the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra and it's a really great pleasure to be here with you and them in the uh, Elizabeth Murdoch Hall at the Melbourne Recital Centre. And I'd actually like to welcome people joining us online through the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra's YouTube channel. Um, my name's Nick Bochner and I'm uh, one of the cellists in the orchestra and this year I'm also the Cybeck Assistant Conductor for Learning and Engagement. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and I pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. This evening we're here to look at the Second Symphony by Schumann. Now this is a really wonderful piece, really, really beautiful, and I'm afraid it's a little bit neglected, a tiny bit underrated. I have to say, in my 20 years here, I don't think I've ever performed it. And if you, for example, you look at the ABC classic, Top 100 Symphonies, it doesn't get a look in. And I think this is a shame. It's a wonderful opportunity now to look at it tonight, and then you really must come to the concert in April and hear the whole thing because it's a really important piece. It's really beautiful and fantastic because it comes at a pivotal time in Schumann's life, but also a really interesting time in the development of the symphony. Um, it was composed in 1846, and this sort of middle of the 19th century, it was a really difficult time for symphonists. Before Beethoven, if you had the opportunity and the interest, you could comfortably write dozens of symphonies. Haydn wrote more than 100, Mozart wrote 40-something. Once Beethoven had done his thing, he totally disrupted that industry. Everybody had no idea what to do next and had to really think hard. Um, he was kind of like a 19th century, you know, Uber or Amazon just flummoxed everyone and they were kind of regrouping for decades after that. Schumann wasn't really put off by that. He was quite prepared to take up that challenge and in this piece we find him really pushing the boundaries of symphonic form and structure, just taking up that challenge. And at the same time, he's using this music to find his way through one of the very difficult periods of his life. Now, these two things, they're not actually separate projects, they become really two sides of the same coin. This symphony is profoundly shaped by Schumann's personal life, his illness, his incredibly deep attachment to his wife, Clara, who was in her own right a wonderful musician, pianist and composer. They went through great struggles to be together, which uh, shaped a lot of his music as well. And of course, he has a very great attachment to literature and writing. The symphony is a large scale work in four movements. And tonight, we're going to look at the very beginning of the first movement, and then we're gonna look at the very end of the last movement to get a sense of how that structure happens. And then we're gonna look at the inner movements because it's in those movements that a lot of the story is told that carries us through that journey. Now, the music that you heard there at the start, that was the introduction to Haydn's final symphony, number 104. Why start with Haydn? Well, for one thing, there really is never a bad moment to listen to a bit of Haydn. I can recommend him highly. But it's really because that opening, that bit of music that you heard, plays a very important part in this piece of Schumann's. For much of 1844 and 1845, Schumann had been very unwell. Uh, he displayed a whole range of symptoms. There was uh, tremors, anxiety, insomnia, auditory hallucinations. Th those were particularly um, bad for him as a composer. He'd hear all sorts of things. And at the time, the doctors saw this as a sort of a nervous condition that was brought on by overwork. So they recommended that he cease work completely. We now know, of course, that these symptoms match very closely with those of tertiary syphilis in its sort of later stages after the initial problems have gone away, it becomes a neurological condition and it's really uh, not a good thing. The other thing that might have been causing him a few uh, problems, at the time it was normal with the uh, early uh, stages of syphilis to be treated with mercury. And um, I don't think that would have been doing his brain any good at all either. Of course, he couldn't bear not to work. It was his whole life. So he tried to find something that he could do that would be not so you know, disturbing and cause these nervous problems and he decided to spend a year studying the music of J.S. Bach. He looked at all of his pieces and he began to compose in the style of Bach. He wrote sets of fugues. He even went so far as to order a piano and had a special one made that had a set of pedals so he could write similar sorts of work to Bach. 
Um, and this, this work that he spent on Bach, it totally changed how he composed. Up to this point, he used to sit down at the piano and he'd write in an absolute white heat of inspiration, sort of improvising and writing down the improvisations. After this time, he would work things out in his head and work at the desk. And this is the first piece, really, that comes out of that new way of working. In 1845, as he felt the first signs of recovery, he wrote to his good friend Mendelssohn, for a few days now, there has been much drumming and trumpeting within me. I have no idea where this will lead to. Well, we know now that that drumming and trumpeting was the Haydn symphony that we heard before, and where it led, of course, was to this wonderful symphony. The symphony documents and represents Schumann's path to recovery, but it also shows a way forward for future symphonic composers. Now, Schumann was a great thinker, and he really liked to spend time thinking about the place of music in culture, and of the place of culture in society. So he had formed a pretty clear idea of how to proceed with the arts and music, and that was to pay close attention to past times and their works, and to insist that only from such a pure source can the best new art be created. He was determined to ignore current fashions in order to hasten and help promote a new poetic era. He was nothing if not quite ambitious. So, in starting the symphony, he takes two very important things from the past and he presents them as a sort of premise, a kind of jumping off point for his symphony. And it takes just four bars for him to give us this very potent mix. Now, there's two things going on there. Firstly, we have the product of his Bach study in the strings. Let's just have a listen to that. It's sort of like one of Bach's chorale preludes, and we have this beautiful counterpoint, which is uh, independent lines that move separately and are very beautiful in themselves, but they join together to make a lovely texture. There's also a hidden reference in there to Bach himself. In Bach's work, he used to like to spell his own name in notes and use that as a theme, B-A-C-H. And you may be wondering, if you were educated in music in um, an English-speaking country, how you get H into music. It's a fair question. In German, for some reason, I don't quite know why, but the H means is B natural, and B is B flat. Actually, can someone just play for me? Do you mind, Sophie? Thank you. Can you just play for me Bach's name? B flat, A, C, B natural. And it's a funny little theme, and this opening um, turn that we get in the first violins is a reference to Bach. Over the top of that, Haydn places this Haydn, I should say Schumann, places this Haydn trumpet call. Now, you really need to remember that theme. We heard it before in Haydn, and now we've heard it in Schumann, because it keeps coming back in this symphony at all of the crucial moments. Now, it's also one of those musical ideas that runs very, very deep, even without its connection to Haydn. The idea of a trumpet call of that sort is something that really speaks to all of us, even in this day and age when I think very few of us have actually marched into battle and anyone who has, you probably haven't done it behind an actual trumpet or bugle. But nonetheless, that trumpet call, that leap of a fifth, that sort of lone brass sound, it kind of retains that significance of being emblematic of worthy struggle, a call to arms. It's deeply part of our cultural inheritance. Now, very soon, so he, Schumann has these two ideas. They're moving along one on top of the other. 
but they very soon start to influence each other. The Bach idea has been moving very carefully by step, and the trumpet call has a leap. The next thing that happens is we get a Bach counterpoint type thing with the leap of the horns in it, the horns and the trumpets. It appears first in the winds. So Schumann's kind of derived this idea, he's distilled it in a way, if you like, he has his Bach and he has his Haydn, and they kind of influence each other and then they become this, and then he turns it into something that's much more modern for his own time. It becomes a little motif of the sort that Beethoven would use. A motif is a group of a few notes that's very recognisable that you can use to build very large structures. Probably one of the most famous motifs of all time would be ya da da dum everyone knows that. And that's what we call a motif. It's instantly recognisable, very simple, and can create huge sections of music. So this is the motif that Schumann creates out of his Bach and Haydn. And that's why so it's kind of distilling. He's taken all of this music and now he's turned it into this one little idea. It's a half a bar. Now this half bar, it needs an answer and it needs um, some balance. So the winds offer that idea, they answer it, and then the strings add their own uh, contribution. Now, one part of this idea, having set up all these, these ideas, there's one thing that really gets Schumann's attention that he can't leave alone. Winds and horns, bar 28. Now, he takes that and then, having derived this whole thing from the Bach and the Haydn, he then re-adds the Bach and the Haydn lines underneath. So we've got all of this stuff going on in a very short space of time and it creates this incredible development of enormous excitement. So what we actually have here in this whole section is an embodiment of Schumann's very idea of the past and the present leading to the future. We're going to listen to this whole introduction now, and I want you to listen particularly for the return of the Haydn trumpeting, because it sets the pattern how, for how that keeps happening throughout the rest of the symphony.
and that's just the introduction. Now, as the son of a publisher, Schumann had a very, very strong interest in writing and literature, and in his teens, he appeared much more likely to become a wordsmith than a composer. Even as he sought to establish himself in his 20s as a performer and a composer, he spent a great deal of energy and time on his new journal for music, which he set up with a group of friends to kind of address all the weaknesses of the age, as he said. So for this reason, we really are best to try and understand Schumann's music in the way that we read a text. Each element of the music represents an idea, and then the way these ideas are kind of combined and played into each other creates a sense of narrative. And of course, it's not a specific story that he's trying to tell. There's this sense of narrative, which means that for each of us, we need to try and work out what he's uh, talking about. And for me, there's this incredible moment in that introduction where there's this kind of eureka. He sort of sounds like he's going, by George, I've got it. I know where I'm going. And then suddenly it all just recedes for a minute, as though he's kind of worked out that having worked out how to go forward, he has to take a step back to do it. And for the rest of this movement, he constructs it fairly similarly to Beethoven, how Beethoven would have done, using that motif that I mentioned before, uh, this one. Winds and Horns, 28. And then we get the rest of the movement based on that. Now, as I said earlier, uh, Schumann takes up the challenge of, um, of following Beethoven. He does it very, very bravely. And we're now going to jump right to the very end of the last movement to see just how he does this. Now, throughout his nine symphonies, Beethoven had sort of been working towards a form that went across the whole symphony. The symphony that Beethoven inherited, it was a group of four movements, and they kind of went together quite nicely, and they formed a sequence. But in his ninth symphony, he referred to earlier movements in the finale, and in doing that, he took great strides towards creating a much more unified whole work, and that was the sort of thing that composers from then on tried to emulate. In the finale of this work, Schumann acknowledges his great musical debt to Beethoven when he brings in a quote from a Beethoven song cycle. And this is one of Schumann's very favorite uh, song cycles and a favorite quote of his. The song cycle is called To the Distant Beloved. And then after introducing that, he goes on to tie this movement back into the first movement and thereby he sort of creates this big unified form. The song that he actually quotes is called Nimm sie denn diese Lieder, or Accept Then These Songs, and this is the tune of it. Now, this is a quote that shows up in three of Schumann's earlier works. It shows up in one of his piano pieces. It shows up in one of his most beloved song cycles, A Woman's Love and Life. And it also shows up in one of his string quartets. Now, Schumann had always loved codes and puzzles and hidden messages in his music. He'd spell the names of places and people that were important to him. But when he was courting Clara, he took this to a whole new level. He had studied piano with Friedrich Wieck, and while he was doing that, he met Clara, who at the time was only 13, um, and he fell in love with her. Maybe not when she was 13, maybe a couple of years later, not entirely clear, but he was very fixated on her, and I think she was quite interested in him. Now, Clara's father did not approve of this match, and that was partly because Mr. Wieck felt that Schumann was of dubious character. He may well have been right. We've already mentioned syphilis. I think enough said about that. Um, and you will find in Schumann's extensive diaries that he did document that he had something of a drinking problem. It was a bit of a demon for him. He tried to give it up. He always promised to. So Mr. Wieck wasn't too impressed. I think it's also, though, that he had such high hopes for Clara and her um, uh, virtuoso career uh, that he really didn't want her dist distracted from that. Um, she did go on to have an extraordinary career. She was an amazing woman. We can't really address her at all as a side note to Mr. Schumann. She deserves her own presentation. Um, Mr. Wieck kept Schumann and Clara apart, but he did let her play Schumann's music. So Schumann did everything he could. He would weave uh, his name and her name. He would quote songs that would refer to text that would just constantly send her this message that he was thinking of her, that they were soulmates, and that they were destined to be together. So clearly, the Beethoven song cycle, to the distant beloved, it's got quite an obvious connection. 
even without knowing that connection, immediately after giving us that little quote of Beethoven, he gives us this uh, set of uh, a sort of a descending scale. Can we just hear the strings on that? It's a simple enough set of notes, but you can see from looking at his earlier work and his diaries that this descending fragment actually represents Clara herself. So in this finale, he's, he gets very personal. He gives us Beethoven, and then he follows it immediately with Clara. The next thing he does is he takes Beethoven, and then he combines Beethoven with Bach, using that beautiful theme from the song and taking Bach's contrapuntal style underneath. Something very important happened in there, something else. Did you hear what it was? Mm, I don't know, maybe you did. It was this. It's almost subliminal at first. The first time it comes, you may not notice it, but it keeps coming back from this point and it starts to drive the whole piece to a conclusion. Just after this, we get a return of one of the earlier ideas. Do you remember that idea that I talked about where we took the Bach and the Haydn and turn them into a, a new idea. This comes back at this point. So, what he's done there by creating this whole large-scale form is it sort of necessarily increases the importance of the finale because it makes us wait right until that point for everything to get a resolution. Quite often in Haydn and Mozart's and even some of Beethoven's earlier symphonies, a lot of the sort of hard work's done in the first movement and the slow movement, and by the time we get to the finale, it's a bit of a celebration. And from this point on in symphonic history, it really is being pushed so that the, the finale, we have to wait till then. So from here until the end of the movement, we get these themes returning and recurring and they combine themselves and then they work themselves out to a final cadence. Now cadence is um, two chords, one after the other, that we use and it closes either a phrase of music or a section or indeed a whole symphony. We're going to play this bit of the very last sort of three minutes of the symphony and there's one more really radical thing that Schumann does and I want to see if you can pick it.
Now, did you work out what's radical about that? Probably doesn't sound very radical because Schumann did something that a lot of people borrowed after that, but what's really interesting is that the final cadence, so the last two main harmonies that you hear in this are actually a plagal cadence instead of a perfect cadence. The plagal cadence is on the fourth and the first degrees of the scale. Everyone else before, Beethoven, Mozart, Schubert, Haydn, when they finished a symphony, they finished it with a perfect cadence, five, one. Now, just to really, I want you to really understand the significance of that. So I'm afraid in order to do that, you're gonna have to sing. Because um, you really gotta sing these cadences to understand them. So what I wanna do here is I wanna split you down the middle of the audience. I'm gonna sing it in two parts. So over this side, can I have a B natural, please? Um. B, five, one. So on this side, I want you to sing. Five, one, can you do that for me please? Go, five, one. Hmm. Sit up straight, bit more diaphragm support, get a bit more air through. Okay, here we go, ready? Go. Five, one. Excellent, and if you want, you can sing it an octave higher. Down this side, we wanna go five, one. So over here, we're gonna go five, one, ready? Five, one, one more time. Five, one. Okay, can we hear all of you together and go? That's not too bad. Let's put the orchestra with that and see what happens. We're gonna go a five one with the orchestra. You ready? Let's go. Yeah, that's pretty good. We're now gonna do a full Beethoven and I want you to all sing really loud. We're gonna go five one, five one, five one, one, one. Just to feel what it feels like. Just straight through in tempo. You ready? Ready for that? Here we go. Go. Five. So that's a perfect cadence, well done to you, nice work. Pretty good. That's a perfect cadence, up to this point, everyone had done it like that. Schumann does this. Now, on this side, you need to sing, it's much easier, you need to sing, fourth one. We'll sing two long notes, can I hear that on this side? One. Excellent, and on this side, you get to sing the same, but you need to say four one instead of five one, so. Four one, on this side, let's go. Too bad. Let's hear everyone together. Okay, that's excellent. Let's do it with the whole orchestra, please. Two long chords. And now we're going to do it one more time, and I want you to sing it to the word Amen. Okay, you ready? Let's go. Hopefully now you see the significance of that plagal cadence. It has a very strong sort of thanksgiving. It's like gratitude. And to some extent, it kind of puts a whole different slant onto everything that's gone before to finish a symphony like that. And in a way, it's interesting because Schumann was not a particularly religious person and it's almost starting that process where the symphony is almost becoming a spiritual artifact in itself. The other little bit radical thing that he does is, because he's finished 4-1, I think he wants to make sure that everyone knows he's finished. So he kind of gives us the skeleton of a perfect cadence in the timpani. Just give us an ex example of what you've got there at the end. And again, it's not something that sounds very radical because a lot of people borrowed it after that, but this is probably the first example at the end of the symphony where we get that sort of timpani solo. So now we've seen how Schumann has pushed the form of the symphony right across the whole, you know, across the whole form, giving us this big structure. And I'm, I know that I've given away the ending of the whole thing, and I'm sorry about that, there was no spoiler alert, but it, it kind of doesn't matter, because it's a lot like an action film. You know the hero is going to prevail and be alive at the end. It's how they do it that really, really matters. And that story, as I said before, is told in the inner movements. We're going to look at the third movement now, and in this symphony, the third movement is a slow movement, like in Beethoven 9. And the very first theme of that, it sounds like a quintessentially Schumann-esque mid to late romantic melody. Let's just have a quick listen to that.
it's not actually Schumann. He's lifted that directly from a work of Bach. It comes from the trio sonata of Bach's musical offering. And he's completely transformed it. It's a little bit like when you hear, I don't know, if you're in a cafe and you hear this tune, you think, oh, that, that sounds familiar. And you realize that somebody has recently covered a tune from, the, you know, a pop song from the 80s or 90s. And they, have, they usually slow it down, they change the, the instruments, and it brings out a whole different character to um, what the original sounded like. And one of the main ways that Schumann does this is he emphasizes the chromaticism. Now let's just talk about chromaticism for a moment, because it's very important to Schumann, and from this time onwards, it's a really important expressive technique. Now, you might remember from your early music lessons, and if you're like me, you may have got them uh, from Julie Andrews, singing as Maria from The Sound of Music. It's a very important part of anyone's musical education. And she sang a really interesting song that was a, it's a tremendous guide to the major diatonic scale. The major diatonic scale sounds like this. Beautiful, and as Julie Andrews says, T brings us back to Do. It's something where we can really hear where we belong. And the reason for that is the distance between the notes are not the same. The distances between the notes are not the same. If you take the other five notes of our Western chromatic scale and you put them in between all the rest of them, it sounds like this. And it starts to get a little bit more confusing. When you're in the middle of the scale, you can't quite tell where you are and where you're going. And for Schumann and composers at that time and later, it was a very useful expressive technique. He was very interested in the ideas of what he wrote in his diaries as Zehnsucht, which is, translates as intense longing, and Seelenschmerz, uh, spiritual pain, very standard romantic ideas. And he wanted to express them in his music. Actually, it's not hard to see how some of this intense longing ended up in the music, because there's a story for when, from when Schumann and Clara were being kept apart, and after nearly a year, they managed to see each other, and they snatched a little bit of time together, and they celebrated this reunion with extended sessions of four-hand piano playing. <laughs> a lot of stuff ends up in the music. Now, we have, <laughs> we have this... Bach melody that he's chromaticized and turned into this spiritual longing and he interrupts it with a horn call. Now the horn call comes from the same sort of stable as the trumpet call of before. It's not a military call so much but again it's a fairly sort of ancient motif that comes from you know shepherds and it's based on the uh, the natural notes of the horn and gives us a total contrast to the chromatic melody. It sounds like this. So now, once again, we've got two really distinct ideas going on. And the way Schumann makes them sort of play into each other, it reminds me of uh, one of his, his love for one of his other idols, which was Schubert. And he um, discovered some of Schubert's music and he translated some of his writings. And he was particularly taken with this one. If I would sing of love, it turned to pain. If I would sing of pain, it turned to love. Thus was I divided between love and sorrow. Schubert's words, very much Schumann's music. So then we get these two ideas combined. Once again, Schumann takes the two ideas and they influence each other. We get a fragment of the chromaticism, which is answered immediately by a fragment of the natural horn call. Now, this is followed immediately by another statement of the Bach theme, and he starts to intensify the chromaticism even more. And in this one, he turns the, starts to make the bass line a full chromatic scale. We're not quite there yet. Initially, the bass line sounds like this.
And over the top of that chromatic scale, we get the winds coming in, and they just give us the beginning of the Bach, again, as though they're kind of looking for somewhere to put it. Now, there's this very quiet struggle for ascendancy here between chromaticism and the natural horn. And then he answers it, he answers this one with a little uh, fragment of the horn call. It's a little bit less confident. And then we get the most extreme example of chromaticism yet. And it's one that really could have come from the pages of a Mahler symphony and absolutely points in that direction of extended chromaticism and even expressionism. We get a full chromatic scale in the bass line. Instead of just uh, six notes there, they do all 12 notes of the chromatic scale. And it pushes the violins ever higher in search of somewhere to put that melody. Let's just have a listen to that. So this really is the essence of this movement, the struggle between these two elements, the chromaticism of the melody and this peaceful acceptance of the horn call. And again, you can read that on the various levels we've been talking about. It clearly is about Schumann's personal struggle with his illness, perhaps his memory of his struggle to find Clara, but it's also about his search forward uh, with the music. Now, the music that we've talked about so far in the movement, from here to this point, that is kind of repeated to form the second part of the music, to give us this beautiful symmetry, but right in the very middle, we get this extraordinarily still and beautiful section. And here, Schumann combines his Clara theme of six descending notes. And he combines that with an incredibly simple and pure uh, version of Bach's counterpoint. And once again, this um, idea of putting Clara and Bach, it's, it's Clara and Bach right at the centre of this movement, absolute peace. And it's again about trying to find this uh, peace in the middle of all this turmoil. It works as pure form and it also works as narrative. Let's have a listen to um, a section of the third movement. I have to warn you, we're not going to play the whole thing, so it might leave your heart bleeding slightly when we stop. But um, I have to do that to you, because apart from anything else, you can come and hear the whole thing, uh, the 16th and the 18th of April in Hamer Hall. <laughs> Let's have a listen to a bit of it.
So, as I said before, you have to wait right till the end of the last movement for the resolution. And this struggle that you're hearing in the third movement, it doesn't really get resolved. It kind of peters out. Chromaticism stays there till the end. But the way Schumann does resolve this extraordinary melody in the last movement is a great surprise, which I don't want to spoil for you tonight. As I said, you need to come and hear the whole thing. One of the great things about working with a group of people like the MSO is that we, you have a wealth of knowledge, experience and passion available to you in the membership of the orchestra. And it covers a huge range of subjects. Some of them are even related to music. Now, we have a musician. <laughs> One of our clarinetists, Craig Hill, um, who has a particular, you have a particular interest in Schumann, don't you? That's right, Nick. Good evening, everyone. You, and in fact, you, to the extent that you have a chamber ensemble devoted to playing the repertoire of Schumann and contemporaries, is That's that right? That's right. It's called the Friends of Eusebius and Florestan. So FEF for short. I'm sure Schumann would have liked that little musical um, letter joke. Yeah, he would have loved that. So Florestan and Eusebius were characters from literature that he put into his music. That's yep. right. Broadly speaking, Florestan is the passionate one, the volatile one, impetuous, and Eusebius is the dreamer. So he used these as, as alter egos in his magazine. He sometimes even signed his pieces F or E to indicate whether the composer was Florestan or Eusebius. And there were a whole host of other characters as well. That's really, that's very interesting. Do you actually have, since you're got such a knowledge of Schumann, do you have a particular sort of, is there something that people could listen to coming up to this concert? that um, you would recommend. Oh, you, I see you have something you prepared earlier. <laughs> well, actually, I've got three top picks, and um, what they all have in common is moments of breathlessness or, or rushing, which is really characteristic of Schumann. He's always rushing towards something, towards destiny, towards a poetic future that he was trying to create with the Second Symphony, or towards, well, Clara, he was rushing towards love which is really interesting because in a modern symphony orchestra, um, rushing is, is, a, is a complete scene. Which you can't do it. You must not rush. Thou shalt not rush. They tell you That's that in the, in, in the first day of the Melbourne Symphony. In fact, I, I think I signed something. Did you sign that? <laughs> Sometimes it's just so hard getting over the bar line. But back to Schumann. He was an expert at rushing. He expressed the character of rushing in a way like no other composer, and that's what brings my picks together. Now, I'm going to ask for the first envelope. I had to do this because I knew if I didn't, I'd keep changing my mind. So whoever's got the first envelope? All right. I just like the Academy Awards here. Oh, <laughs> yes. And actually, Schumann would have loved the idea of this as a secret letter with, from him to Schumann, from him to Clara, something maybe with a slight bit of encryption so that the father-in-law didn't find it. Not, not too difficult, of course, but maybe just something that she could understand with the use of a grand piano and a, an encyclopedic knowledge of Shakespeare. <laughs> anyway, back to, back to the recommendations. So first recommendation. Recommendation is the, is the piano quintet. It's a popular classic, of course, and it's a great way for you to come to Schumann if you haven't listened to much of his music before. It's very tightly structured in much the same way as the Second Symphony and with some great examples of breathless surging forward. In fact, the whole third movement is just one surge after another. So, the piano quintet. Envelope number two, please. Oh, yeah. If you like vocal music, then Liederkreis, Opus 39. It's 12 short songs on typical romantic themes. So there's longing and separation and all that. Um, Mondnacht or Moonlit Night is one of Schumann's most beautiful songs. It's rightly famous. Um, in that song, the heavens reach down to kiss the earth and um, they meet as one soul. Now, I think we know who Robert was talking to there. Um, but it's a top, also a top pick because of the way the last movement in the cycle, this 12th song, rushes towards the conclusion and then almost evaporates. So if you can, listen to the recording with Olaf Bear and the Australian pianist Geoffrey Parsons. It's just unbelievable. Okay, and finally, envelope number three, please. Thank you. So if you enjoy string quartets, then number three in A, Opus 41, is my pick. It's got a complete Clara obsession going on. And even when he decides to interrupt the flow with four big punctuating chords, what's the next thing he does? Clara. So, 
the second theme of this string quartet has this great breathless melody with a pulsating accompaniment, but it also, this work gets my pick because of the best cello pizzicato passage of 1841 in the slow movement. It's right up there with Schubert's C major quintet, if you know that work. Um, have a listen to Schumann's string quartet number three in A. They're my three top picks, thank you. Bravo, thank you very much. So now I'm a little concerned that they picked the wrong person to talk to you about Schumann. Anyway, that was magnificent, Craig. Thank you very much. Now, we're going to look at the second movement, and it's very apt, because Craig was there talking about rushing, and there's quite a lot of rushing forward that happens in this movement. You'll see the first violins shifting nervously in their seat seats. Anyway, so one of the aspects of the symphony that has actually always really fascinated me is how we get from the minuet and trio, which is a movement in the early classical symphonies of Mozart, a very restrained, very refined, uh, quite lightweight sort of movement. By the time we get to Mahler and Shostakovich, we have movements that are packed with irony and sarcasm and character and great narrative power, to the extent that I think in one of Mahler's symphonies, maybe seven, he actually includes two movements of this type that stem from the original minuet and trio. And yet I really wonder how we actually got there. Now, Beethoven did a lot for that journey, actually Haydn did as well, because the first thing they did, the minuet is a very, it's a court dance, and it's very, very restrained, and to our ears these days it sounds quite, quite archaic. Haydn and Beethoven started to swap out the minuet and they put in a scherzo, with scherzo is Italian for joke, and it's similarly usually a movement that has kind of a dance movement, but it's generally faster and more energetic. So that's the first thing Beethoven did. And then the other feature of a minuet and trio is you get the minuet, a contrasting trio, and the minuet comes back. So you've got this nice ABA form. Beethoven started to play with that, and he would actually bring the A form back more than once and put in different trios and sometimes kind of trick you as to whether maybe we were going back again. But still, it was quite a rigid form. In this symphony, Schumann starts to break down that rigidity and he starts bringing in characters and a kind of a narrative. And once again, it's the inclusion of the very personal that pushes this development forwards. Now, there's been extensive work, as Craig alluded to, uh, there's been extensive work done over the years on Schumann's love of codes and ciphers. And there's some fairly compelling evidence that specific keys held very particular meanings for him. Now, the scherzo of this symphony, just warning to the orchestra, we we're about to play something, the scherzo of this symphony opens with a very unstable idea in C major. So it's unstable both harmonically. So here's the accompaniment to the beginning of this movement. of diminished chords which are inherently unstable and it's pushing through various keys but it's also very unstable melodically and the first violins are rushing around all over the place. That's really quite a tricky thing to do. I was afraid that, I, I mentioned I've been in the orchestra for 20 years and I've got some very dear friends here and I was afraid that perhaps some of those friendships would be damaged by asking them to do that. I guess we'll see tomorrow. Now, in terms of keys, this short section that you've just heard, it presents us with C major and then E flat major. Now, C major is a key that represented Clara, partly because of the letter C, but also because it has a no key signature and it's very pure. And of course, for Schumann, Clara was the purest of angels. E flat, again with that slightly odd German thing, E flat is spelt S in, uh, in German, and so that was a key that represented himself, Schumann. And then it quickly moves to G minor, and you can see from his songs and writings that G minor was a key that represented parental authority. So we sort of have Clara being chased by Schumann and then crashing into the parent. Now, it's sort of like, <laughs> it's kind of, <laughs> it's sort of, you know, a compressed, version of that whole drama, and I'm not suggesting that he actually intends to tell that story there, but just that habit of using those keys to, to signify these things, it gives us this 12 bar, what I think of as a dilemma, and this is the thing that is just going to keep coming back through this whole movement. 
Now, as it goes on to the next section, there's a very, very unusual element, and it's quite difficult to pull off. Instead of this constant sort of steady movement forward, there's a hesitation in the rhythm, and it's just before we slip into B major. And for Schumann, B major was a key that represented marital union. And so in this movement, we actually get a period of relative stability, 10 bars where it seems quite happy. We even get a nice perfect cadence in B major. You remember your perfect cadence from such times as half an hour ago. And it, it seems like it's going to settle down for a minute, but it actually doesn't. We're going to have a quick listen to how th that sequence of keys uh, runs into that point. So just the top of this movement. So the element of instability that we introduce, and ironically he brings it in in the B major section, it's this kind of accent on the last quaver of the bar. We've got this nice movement, yut da 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 yut da da, and it's something that Haydn and Beethoven like to do as well, kind of sticking an accent where you don't expect it. Uh, let's just have a quick listen to that. This is bar 20, bar 21 with the upbeat. <laughs> So you can hear that there in the winds. They're just destabilizing everything. So as you've already heard, we've had that original di dilemma that Schumann sets up and then something else, and then the dilemma comes back. And that just keeps happening throughout this movement. And it creates a very sort of interesting narrative effect. It's a little bit like, excuse my um, ancient pop culture reference, but it reminds me of the movie Groundhog Day where we have this thing that just keeps coming back and it's kind of a problem and it goes into a different section and then it comes back and it goes into a different section as though it's really trying to work out how to get out of it. Now, this opening scherzo section is closed with a kind of compression and combination of all the elements we've had so far. You get the scurrying violins, you get this lovely perfect cadence, you get the unstable harmony and the disturbing accents, and they, all these elements kind of crash into each other to create a sort of a stuttering and a frustrated finish. And so we now come to the first contrasting section, trio number one, and Schumann really starts to bring his character work to the fore here. The winds offer an idea which is a perfect contrast to the main scherzo, and that's exactly what we expect at this point. It's different in every way. We've got a different key, G major. It's a different rhythmic feel. Instead of the rushing semiquavers, it's got triplets, so it sounds more relaxed. Yep, da, 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 da. Let's have a listen to that idea. But unfortunately, the strings don't seem all that impressed with that. And they offer something that's a little bit sighing. It's coming back to the harmonic instability. I don't think they exactly agree with the winds. So the winds offer their idea again. And this time, the strings interrupt with this sighing, and they extend it. So we again have this kind of uh, effect of two characters that are in conversation, or perhaps competition. So the strings have introduced this idea oh, that contradicts the winds, and it unsettles things further. They bring in that uh, offbeat accent.
So at one point, the, wind, the strings actually hesitatingly take up the wind's idea, as though they're thinking of going along with that. But then the winds take over with more confidence, and the strings take us right back to the opening uh, section of this trio. Let's have a quick listen to that. So we had come back now because of this disturbance. We end up with a complete repeat of the opening scherzo. So we've really got Schumann showing us how the form of the scherzo can be used to introduce characters, provide commentary on them, and develop this sense of narrati narrative. Now, Schumann morphs this relaxed idea of the first trio back into the scherzo, and we get a complete repeat of the first section. And that's, again, that's exactly what we expect. What we don't expect is at the end of that section, he gives us a second contrasting idea. And this one provides an even greater contrast. And it's once again Schumann's obsession with the idea of Bach and kind of using it to try and find peace in the middle of all this turmoil and uncertainty. It's a very, very simple theme, and it's, uh, but it still has the seeds of its own unrest in it. I don't know if you heard in there, but there's a little uh, swell, and as this um, section goes on, it becomes an accent, and once again, it disturbs things. The first violins are so happy with their original dilemma that they start trying to bring it back the rest of the orchestra doesn't go with it. But they are determined to unsettle things and they take us right back to the beginning of the trio. So there's that sort of groundhog day. We just can't get away from it. How does Schumann get out of this endless loop? Well, the first thing he does is he calls in reinforcements for the first violins. We're skipping 38 and going to 39. He And he also then begins to ramp up the uh, harmonic instability and tension in the accompaniment, giving us more and more of those offbeat accents. And of course, our old friend Haydn the, in the trumpets, they finally save us. So I think we, we're going to listen to the whole of that scherzo in a minute because I think it contains so much of what Schumann was about. And I think he really was one of the more misunderstood composers. He was something of an enigma in his own time. He was a bit of an outsider. He really wasn't great with people. He found it difficult to speak and people found him somewhat aloof and taciturn. He had a love of trying new ideas. He was always pushing the boundaries, and that meant that a lot of his music in his own time, it wasn't necessarily that well received or understood. And I think for successive generations of listeners, perhaps they don't find him as clear and etched as Beethoven, but they don't also find him as lush and fully romantic as Tchaikovsky and Brahms, for example. And also, I think there has been always this idea that his creativity was inextricably linked to his so-called madness, and that's really coloured the judgement of his work. Schumann was, in fact, a visionary, and he managed to harness the growing importance of the individual in society to bring a more intensely personal element to the symphony. By making this symphony so very personal, he has, in fact, it greatly expanded the universal expressive potential of the form. This symphony presents us with Schumann's search for peace and happiness amongst the difficulties that he faced. And the larger overarching message grows out of these very personal struggles. 
Unfortunately, Schumann didn't in fact find that peace for very long. He died in 1856, aged just 46, having spent two years isolated from his family in an asylum after having thrown himself into the Rhine in his, uh, at, despair, at his despair in, uh, of his condition. And in this symphony, though, he really presents us with an alternative reality, and it's one in which we can see him, or I should probably say one in which we can hear him triumph forevermore. So as I said, we're going to finish with a uh, performance of this wonderful skirt so, so you can hear all of those things about Schumann that we've spoken about, his character work coming from his literary interest, his fascination with the past to find a way forward, and of course his anxious and neurotic but ultimately optimistic outlook.